actually, let me just let me just mention this a little bit. Another another reason why I say we are we are very different than eddy current is because eddy current is very frequency dependent. In other words, if you want to do a shallow scan, you'll operate at a much higher frequency, a megahertz or so. In the in the low kilohertz range, uh, you you'll have greater depth of penetration. But here, this is one sensor where we go from 145 kilohertz to 677 kilohertz, nearly uh, uh, just over, actually, half a megahertz. We get no change in output. So it's a very different phenomenon that we're looking at here. And I haven't gotten to why it's different, but uh, in, in just a couple slides, I will. I just inserted that slide at the last minute. You, you get a thumb drive, a USB drive with, this, uh, with these lectures. That slide uh, won't be in it. I just decided to add it at the last minute because somebody was asking me about it. It was a very curious thing and a big divergence from eddy current. Here, I talked about Q uh, and how we measure Q, but also what's important is peak voltage. If you notice that peak, that, that uh, the maximum operating voltage of that uh, frequency uh, suite. It's very important and in fact we get the best response out of our sensor when you multiply Q by the peak voltage, not just Q alone. In fact, um, here for instance we have a Q of 14.43. My laser is not working so well. But uh, you have a Q of 14.34 uh, here and the signal's quite low, and that was that low blue line that we saw from the 094 crack. And here we have a Q of 4.54, and it's higher. But when you multiply it by the peak voltage at that Q, you can see that you have this nice correlation with Q sub V here, I call it Q sub V, um, of 11.25, but here it's 36. And that was a Q of 13.63. So in order to determine the best operating frequency for a sensor, it's not just its output voltage, it's not just its Q, it's, those, it's the product of the two. Any questions so far? That means I'm describing it very well. <laughs> this is the first lecture I've given on this sensor, so, uh, you know, Either, you, either you're, you, uh, you don't get it or you do get it very well. Another thing that happens with the sensor that's, that's curious is as we park the, the sensor in front of a target, and let's call the target a piece of titanium, it could just as easily be a piece of composite or aluminum, whatever, and we move the sensor away, if you recall that resonant frequency point resonates at a very particular frequency, what happens as you move the sensor away, that resonant frequency shifts to the left. It goes to lower frequencies. And you can directly relate that frequency shift to distance. And that's important because quite often you'll be scanning something which has variability in air gap, variability in the distance from the face of the sensor to the target. And such, a, such an object is a, a weld bead. Our orbital weld bead will have varying geometry, and that variation in geometry, just like an eddy current sensor, will induce a large signal output. And you want to discern the difference between what signal is attributable to, to distance and what signal is attributable to flaws that might be present uh, in the material. So this is something that we used in an e-beam weld. That, that, that last chart yep. told me that a gap is good or a gap is bad. It, it's indifferent. Um, you mean this chart here or that chart there? Yeah, since the 20 mil gap, I have a large output voltage. Looks like it's a good thing to have a gap. Well, it depends on what the voltage is attributable to. If you have a lot of voltage attributed to uh, the fact that you're farther away versus uh, a bigger voltage change relative to a defect, um, you want to be able to separate those two. So it's neither good nor bad, especially if you can separate them. Okay. And I didn't mention this graph here. This graph shows that over the short distance of about 20 thou, and it was 20 thou because um, at 20 thou you can pretty much cover the weld bead. There's not much more variation than that. You can go much greater than 20 thou, but in, in this realm, the relationship between frequency shift 
and distance is fairly linear. It is really not linear. It, it's subject to the inverse uh, uh, square law, just like anything else in electromagnetic field. But in this short range here, I treat it linearly because it makes it easier to do some of the calculating I did later. If you were at a much greater distance, you would, of course, use the inverse square law. This is a section of an E-beam weld on a titanium plate. This is actually from a um, fuel tank on a rocket. And here, the red line is the raw sensor output. So we're scanning this weld and we're getting a huge variation in our output. And that huge variation is due to the varying geometry in this weld bead. And what we did was the blue line represents the frequency shift of the, free, of the uh, sensor. And when we take that frequency shift using that lookup table that we had where we correlated distance to frequency, and if we could correlate distance to frequency, then we can also correlate frequency to output voltage change. We did that and we normalized the graph here. So we turned this, this red graph, which had huge undulations in data, into something that was much more manageable from a, um, from a data processing perspective. And the goal here was to be able to find cracks that were 50 thou long and certainly 94 thou long. We have the data for that from that nice crack plate that I showed you. But that's a pr pristine plate. Um, we never have the luxury of having a pristine plate when we're imaging a weld. Welds are ugly sometimes. And so you have to be able to pluck that data out of this mass of changing data that's in the weld. And the, the output associated with the 051 crack is two and a third volts there. And here, the data slopes up, but we have filtering algorithms that can flatten that out, so I'm not so concerned with that. What I'm concerned with is the peak-to-peak -peak change over that data set is only one volt. That means we're better than two to one in being able to pull out um, the SIF size or critical initial flaw size of 051 out of a weld that wasn't particularly smooth. EB weld has a lot of splatter on it, so um, it's still robotically done. Uh, it's not a hand weld. Hand welds are even worse. But this demonstrates the ability to pull out uh, cracks out of that. You're moving the sensor around the circumference of the tube. So yeah. your distance is the circumference as you're moving around? Mm -hmm. That's that correct. Yeah. But in this case, we happen to be dealing with flat plate. I'll show you the machine that goes around, but they're, they're okay. relatable. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, just yeah. another question. So it looks like you're getting a frequency output which is proportional to the distance between the sensor and the plate. That's right. And a amplitude output which is proportional to the characteristic of the material. Field. Correct. Right. Okay. That's correct. All right. Yeah. And we're able to separate the two. Right. Cool. And combine the two more interesting. And combine them. And, and, and that's important, as you say, because you begin to develop, being able to develop 3D models of what's going on. If you can measure distance, and characteristic of what's going on, you can begin to build a 3D model. Okay, we can image insulators, we can image plastic, we can image paper, um, glass, ceramic, your finger, and it doesn't make sense from an eddy current perspective that you should be able to do that because those things are not conductors. So why can we do it? And I spent a long time on this, and there still may be more to find in terms of why we can do it, but from a rough order of magnitude, it seems to make sense, and I'll explain why in the next slide. But we have a core, a ferrite core, in our sensor, as you would in, in say, an eddy current sensor. Um, and we transfer energy by way of mu mutual inductance from one coil to the next. And that's a, a transfer constant here um, uh, multiplied by the square root of the inductance of the first coil times the inductance of the second coil. You've all seen that before. But what we also have now is um, the inductance of each coil is now subject to this equation, 
where you have um, permeability of free air um, times the permeability of the core times a your constant here your inductance constant and and now going to the geometry of the uh, of the coil the number of turns times the area divided by the length if the length of the of the coil becomes much bigger than the diameter of the coil it becomes very difficult to calculate inductance which is why you have this k factor it's it's a it's a cheat factor it's it's you don't know what it's going to be so uh, in this case there's the it's the uh, uh, Nagaoka uh, constant or coefficient that I'm using but there are half a dozen other ones and you basically have a lookup table for when you get these odd coils so we're dealing in an area here where the science it's not subjective it's just difficult to calculate exactly what you've got and quite often you result to an empirical test you just test it and and find out what the inductance of the coil is because it is so difficult but this is the target for instance that we're going over let's call it titanium or composite or plastic and the proximity of the target is is obviously farther away from the core the core is being saturated in the center of this oscillating magnetic field but that target becomes part of the overall inductance of the total circuit and so in other words that that target has its own permeability inducing an effect on the inductance of that coil and if that permeability is great for instance with metals it has a large effect um, if that permeability is small, such as in plastics, it has a much smaller effect. Because of the eddy current effect in the sensor, normally when you're scanning a piece of metal, it overwhelms the effect that might be seen from slight changes in permeability. The permeability number can be very low, but the effect of the eddy current by way of conductivity is very high, so it's masked. You don't see it. You don't see it until you start to image things that are not conductive. Does everybody follow me on that? The target become part, becoming part of the permeability of, of the coil? Yeah, it's not air. It's not air.